Our breaking news tonight, an eyewitness coming forward, talking only to 360, who saw the shooting of Trayvon Martin and the aftermath. What did you observe after the shot? Um, as I said, it was dark, but after the shot, um, obviously someone, uh, uh, so my man got up, and um, it was kind of like that period of him, I can't say I actually watched him get up, but maybe only within like, couple seconds or so uh then he was walking towards where i was watching and i could see him a little bit clearer and see that that was a Hispanic man and he was um you know he didn't appear hurt or anything else he just kind of seemed very uh you know i can't speak for him but you know very worried or whatever walked like on the sidewalk at that point and put his hand up to kind of his forehead and then uh another man came out with a flashlight Joining us now is police veteran Lou Palumbo, currently he's director of the private security firm Elite Group Limited. Also, Martin family attorney Daryl Parks, criminal defense attorney Mark Garagos, and former Los Angeles deputy district attorney Marsha Clark. Daryl Parks, I wonder as you listen to, to this, uh, this new uh, eyewitnesses account uh, of what happened, of, of what this person saw, what's your reaction? Does it answer any questions for you, raise any new questions for you? It answers a lot of questions for me, Anderson. It's very clear that this particular witness saw what happened, and in his early part of his statement, he clearly indicated the person that he saw on top um, was the gentleman who did the shooting. So it's rather clear that Mr. Zimmerman was a shooter. He saw him, although he has some parts he doesn't recall quite as well. Um, the first part of his statement that I, that I see is that he saw um, Trayvon Shallow in this very unfortunate night. The other part that really strikes out to me is that he seems to not see any apparent injuries um, from this particular altercation that Mr. Zimmerman claims that he um, suffered. But thirdly, um, although this is my first time hearing his, his, his statement, it seems very clear that um, Zimmerman's statement about Tra Trayvon following him back to the truck is totally untrue because from this witness's statement, all of the interaction happened in one particular area. So I think Mr. Zimmerman is going to be arrested very, very soon. Um, I should also just point out we've, we've altered this person's voice just uh, at their request uh, because they, wanted, uh, they don't want their identity known. Uh, Mark Garagos, when you listen to this account, d does it raise anything new for you? Well, first of all, Anderson, I want to tell you it was a great direct examination by you. I kudos to you. <laughs> Second of all, this is precisely why prosecutors cringe. I bet you when you ask Marsha about this, this is a prosecutor's, or it should be a prosecutor's worst nightmare. There is so much fodder in there now for the defense to talk about if he is indeed in re arrested, if Zimmerman is arrested, for them to play around with now, I can't even tell you. I mean, I could, you could spend uh, 45 minutes with this witness and use it to your advantage if you're defending Zimmerman. Marcia, what about that? Mark's right. Uh, the more we have witnesses being interviewed by non-police sources and, and interviewed under circumstances like this, the more opportunity there is to talk about inconsistencies, to get additional, <clears throat> excuse me, additional statements and, and to show the conflicts between them. This is a very, it seems to me, honest witness who is trying to tell you to the best of his ability what he saw, but any normal person is going to tell a story different ways at different times. You don't say it the same way every time. A defense attorney will have a field day with that. However, it was not entirely clear to me, although I wanted it to be, that the person on top was the person who did the shooting. What, it may be where very well so. That may be the case. Um, I think you need to, we're going to need to do a lot more investigation. I think the gunshot uh, residue on the bodies uh, and on the clothing will tell you a lot more about the angle of the shot, which is going to be critical to this investigation. But the fact that George Zimmerman stood up walked away with no apparent difficulty, uh, no apparent bleeding, seems to fly in the face of the indications in the release report that he was, uh, that he said he was, his nose was broken, his head was beaten in. Yes, there may have been some uh, minor injuries due to scuffle, but what's being described by this witness indicates it was no major struggle. Very likely the one who was crying for help was Trayvon. Uh, very likely the one who was being pinned down was Trayvon. And the fact that this witness said that Trayvon Martin was face down when George Zimmerman stood up is another indication that it was George Zimmerman who did the attacking and that it was a scuffle initiated by him and ended by him. We should also point out, uh, Lou, that uh, another uh, eyewitness interviewed by other 
other uh, news uh, organizations, local news, uh, have, have said that that, that eyewitness uh, who's calling himself John or, or was referred to as John uh, says he saw George Zimmerman yelling out for help. But again, Trayvon uh, Martin's family insists that it's his voice on the tape crawling out, calling out for help. What did you make of what this eyewitness said? Um, I, I have to agree with the first gentleman. I, I think for Mr. Zimmerman it's quite problematic at this point because, A, I'd like to see the autopsy report on this young man. I'd like to hear what Zimmerman's accounting was when he discharged the weapon. Did he tell the police he was on the top or did he tell them he was on the bottom? If he was on the bottom, where did he shoot the kid? Was it an abdominal hit? Because that, be, that would be possibly consistent with bleeding from the mouth. Or was, there should be forensic evidence for all of this. There's got to be a load of, and, and that's what I, I kind of spoke to this yesterday. Where's the autopsy and where's the forensics on this? I want to know the distance when the shot was fired, the angle of entry, the positions of the body. I mean, there's a lot of questions here, but I, I think that this punches some holes in uh, Zimmerman's uh, allegation that he was being beaten to the point where he felt it was appropriate to use deadly physical force. The, the witness uh, I talked to, Mr. Parks, said that this was occurring on grass, on ground, not on a sidewalk. So if somebody's head was being hit into the ground, as, as uh, Mr. Zimmerman uh, has apparently indicated, or his family's indicated, uh, it wasn't onto a sidewalk, onto concrete, it was onto to grass or ground. Mr. Parks, as you know, George Zimmerman's father gave an interview to uh, WOFL in Orlando. I want to play for our viewers some of what, what he said happened in the confrontation between his son and, and Trayvon Martin. At that point, he was punched in the nose, his nose was broken, and he was knocked to the concrete. Trayvon Martin got on top of him and just started beating him in the face, in his nose, hitting his head on the concrete. After nearly a minute of being beaten, uh, George was trying to get his head off the concrete, trying to move uh, with Trayvon on him into the grass. Uh, in doing so, his firearm was shown. Trayvon Martin said something to the effect of, you're gonna die now, or you're gonna die tonight, something to that effect. He continued to beat George, and at some point, George pulled his pistol and did, did what he did. So you're saying that Trayvon Martin verbally threatened his life? Yes. Mr. Parks, it does seem to contradict what the witness we just talked to said that the altercation took place in the grass, whether that means the witness saw it at a later time or was simply wrong or Mr. Zimmerman was wrong. What do you make of what he said? Well, I think he clearly is wrong. Number one, um, the witness has clearly said that they were in the grassy area. Both altercations happened in the grassy area. But also, though, the real problem is that, tr that Mr. Zimmerman's father says that all of this happened on the sidewalk. We now have pictures of Mr. Zimmerman walking into the police station, and you see no injuries that would have come from abrasions on a sidewalk. So clearly, he's wrong. And, and this witness is right, because we don't see any injuries that would have come from a sidewalk had this, all of this great physical force happened on a sidewalk. Mark Garagos, do you put a lot of stock into this, these, these tapes now from the police station, where, where, at least in those tapes, and again, it's bad lighting, the camera angle is not good, where you don't see blood on George Zimmerman? Only if he wasn't treated at the scene. If he was treated at the scene and they cleaned him up at the scene, no, then it's not going to matter one whit. They're going to, somebody's going to do a timeline. They're going to try to determine what time the, the witness saw this person. Then they're going to say, what time was this uh, videotape played? And if in the 20 minutes uh, in between somebody cleaned him up, no, it doesn't matter whatsoever. Marsha Clark, a lot of people uh, have emailed me saying the police weren't, didn't seem to be wearing gloves when dealing with George Zimmerman. Would that surprise you if there was blood on him? Yes. All police officers know nowadays with AIDS and with all the, the uh, kinds of diseases that are transferred by blood that any bleeding suspect or witness or victim, you have to glove up. You don't take any chances with that. I don't see how the police could have been handling him the way they were if he was as bloody as he should have been with a broken nose. Anyone who's seen a broken nose is aware of the fact that the blood spurts. That leads to a lot of bleeding. You would have expected to see blood on the front of George Zimmerman's shirt. Head wounds, by the way, are known to bleed profusely. You would have expected to see blood in his shirt collar, uh, blood, you know, in, in many more places, and certainly the police officers being more careful. Can I also say, Anderson, that the statement made by, I believe it was George Zimmerman's father that you just played, yeah. if that's correct, 
He says that when George Zimmerman pulled out the gun, then Trayvon Martin said, you're going to die tonight. Who says that? That makes no sense at all. You're unarmed. Somebody else pulls a gun and you, your first response is to tell him he's going to die? I don't think so. Hmm. So I'm going to say that that statement doesn't make a lot of sense logically. And of course, it does conflict with an eyewitness's statement who said it all happened on the grass. Uh, we we got to leave it there, unfortunately, just for time. Uh, Lou Palumbo, appreciate it. Mark Garrigo, as always, Marcia Clark, uh, Daryl Parks uh, as well. Uh, CNN uh, presents, uh, is going to present a special town hall beyond Trayvon, race and justice in America, hosted by Soldat O'Brien. That's tomorrow night, 8 o'clock Eastern. Then again tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Eastern. I hope you join us for that.